thanks a lot, Professor Patasati, for the introduction. Uh, <clears throat> I'll try and be a bit briefer. There, I probably have one or two slides more than necessary, and I might rush through them. First, I'd like to thank Dinesh immensely for this opportunity to share some of the work that we've been doing. We had released this manifesto about a year and a half back in Hyderabad. And in some sense, we are very fortunate to be releasing the revised version today. We just got it from the uh, printers yesterday, and this is probably as, as good an occasion to try and share these ideas. So thanks a lot, Dinesh, and the network that he's been leading. Um, I, I teach at the Xavier Institute of Management, Bhubaneswar, but I'm a part of a network. Many other colleagues here are also part of it. Professor Haribabu is also there, which is called the Knowledge in Civil Society uh, Network, which was looking at issues on you know, science and democracy. Uh, and as part of that, there was an attempt to try and look at a people's statement on science and technology, which eventually worked out into this manifesto. So what I'll do today is I'll very briefly speak about the context of the manifesto on the kind of global rethinking that's going on in innovation. You heard Adrian speak about that. And particularly focus on issues of innovation and what we call knowledge democracy in India. And then spe I mean, spell out what's there in the Knowledge Swaraj manifesto, the process that we've been through and some of the ideas. And also very briefly touch upon the initiative that we've had in saying if these are the principles which uh, Professor Hari Babu spoke about earlier on plurality, justice, and sustainability. How could we take it forward in, say, four or five sectors? And we had a few pilot projects uh, supported by the SEDDEV project, and we just completed that. And those ideas actually fed into the manifesto, apart from the discussions that we've received from people earlier, and we've just brought together this document. Adrian has spoken about the Sussex Manifesto. I don't want to touch more on that. But I think this is part of a process on rethinking innovation, which also includes the report by Brian Wynn on taking no European knowledge society seriously uh, and the important shift from a knowledge economy to a knowledge society. Uh, and more recently, in February, the European Union has come out with a green paper on research and innovation, in which they say that the in Europe, the research, business, government, and civil society communities and citizens are called upon to engage in this important debate. And uh, as you know, Dinesh's note had earlier mentioned about the National Innovation Council and the decade of innovation, so we do speak about uh, this interesting context that we have, where there are ideas about from Jugaad to frugal engineering, and also an additional D, which I would like to start off with, which is there in the document of the National Innovation Council, which speaks of discourse. So I'll start with the last one and then get back very briefly to the other two. In the presentation that the National Innovation Council has made, there's a very interesting footnote, which I think is central to the agenda that we're talking about. It talks about alternatives, but it's there almost in the subtext of the document. And this is what it says. And it says that finally for room for discourse, is critical to accommodate alternate views and voices and create a culture of questioning. We want to create the right avenues for discussions and debates to get the right inputs from outside the system as well. A very interesting initiative that we would like the National Innovation Council to take seriously. Yesterday, while traveling from Bhubaneswar to Delhi, I tried understanding, I mean, I happened to read this news item in the business line, which speaks about Israel's systematic invention thinking firm, it's a big consultancy firm, helping the council to create an innovation roadmap for India. Uh, the question that one has, is that the only system that should be considered? Are we only talking about these kinds of international consultancy firms which can provide ideas? How can we expand the space for discourse on innovation in the country? The document speaks about actually even these words about subversive and irreverent dialogue. So in some sense, my Presentation is a subversive and irreverent dialogue with the National Innovation Council. So can NIC and the scientific establishment provide citizens space for this kind of a dialogue? And what if citizens were to actually write their own policy? And this knowledge Swaraj is in some sense an attempt, maybe a, uh, an incomplete attempt. What we're trying to say, and this is there in the text, that as important as the SNT policy for India is the self-rule by Indian people of their science and technology that not only implies an effort to think from the perspectives of the people of India when drafting the policy document, but also an effort to create the necessary accompanying measures 
by reinventing Indian democracy and its social institutions. So this manifesto reinstalls the citizen as an expert, as an inventor, reinstalls the richness of parallel knowledge systems, but also celebrates the morality of the weak and the marginalized. It challenges the current moral base of SNT as validated by the state, and there was some reference to it in the morning as well. A new SNT policy for and by the people needs cognitive justice. It gives, following Gandhi, an identity of strength to the weak. Is this really utopian in science policy? And then if you look at Brian Wynne's own uh, effort on the European knowledge society, a very interesting chapter on reinventing innovation, where there is a discussion on the regimes of innovation and a regime of an economic techno-scientific promise and an alternative regime of collective experimentation. Amongst the recommendations that the report makes is a shift to plural conditional advice and not a single prescriptive advice, to value social distribution of knowledge and not a centralization and a different kind of IPR regime, to support autonomous collective experimentation, and to establish a new community research council. The question one can ask is that can the National Innovation Council become one such community research council and we heard Professor Anil Gupta speak about it very well. But do we have the institutional mechanisms that will enable this to happen? What if it actually were to become a community research council? Is this so impractical that this is not part of policy? And then if you go to and look at the European Green Paper, which was released in February 2011, they listed a list of 20 odd questions. And I've just picked up four or five from them, which says, should there be room for more bottom activities? <coughs> How could EU research and innovation, and I just want to replace many places EU with India to talk about the Indian policy context, uh, attract greater interest in involvements of citizens and civil society? How should EU funding best take account of the broad nature of innovation, including non-technical technological innovations, eco-innovation and social innovation? Aramar Ravi spoke about this. Why does the National Innovation Council not take Indian citizens as seriously as international consultancy firms? Is self-reliance and Swaraj not a concern anymore in Indian science policy? And I'm taking on from a debate that some of us had, which was organized by the University of Hyderabad on self-reliance and <laughs> science technology in nation building. If you look at broadly the Indian science and technology, looking at this issue of democracy, knowledge, and, and how it's related, we do recognize that in all the documents, innovation is valued. But whose kind of innovation? It's often the innovation of the expert that is probably privileged more than necessary. People need and have a right of access to science and technology, but they probably don't have enough of a space to create science and technology. So we may have an infrastructure to try and get internet connectivity across the country, but to try and actually receive knowledge and inputs from people and citizens isn't quite there. There is an unwillingness of or lacking of independence and openness in discussion, and this came out in the Inter-Academy report of B.T. Brinjal. Which, was, which received a lot of criticism. There was mention of the draft innovation law, and we were happy to know that it is rejected. But if you look at the document, and one of my students, who unfortunately couldn't come because of the delay of the train, uh, they had seen it and then just did a simple check. And they find that there's no mention of the poor, no mention of grassroots, no mention of the community, and no mention of civil society. Just a few words, keywords that just seem to be absent from the draft innovation law. Uh, ICR does a reorganization. They say, OK, public sector has failed. Let's give it to the private sector. They'll do things. Uh, the reorganization report does not speak anything of a huge farming crisis that exists in the country. There's nothing open about the knowledge initiative in agriculture, which the Indian government had signed, or such kinds of reports. The Tamil Nadu state government came up with a bill. These are some examples on agriculture, which actually sought to penalize non-agricultural graduates from offering advice to farmers. So if Professor Norman Apoff, who's done a lot of work on system of rice intensification, were to offer anything, he might even be put behind bars, because it was the preserve of only the agricultural graduates from Tamil Nadu Agricultural University. Luckily, the government withdrew after a little bit of opposition. We have draconian laws like the Biotechnology Regulatory Authority of India, which prevents citizens from speaking about what they think of uh, these issues. The midterm appraisal of the Levin Plan on Agriculture celebrates private extension, ignoring a huge movement in community-based extension that's actually happening in the country. 
So questions that we have and I'd like to post it a bit openly. How inclusive is the NIC's agenda for inclusive innovation? Will it include hitherto in ignored pathways and Adrian was also mentioning about this in science policy? Will it seek to correct knowledge hierarchies and allow for participation? Will it show the willingness to learn from other kinds of expertise and knowledge systems? Will it recognize civil society as a partner in science policy processes? Apart from Anil Gupta, it's difficult to find a single member in the National Innovation Council who has uh, you know, the kind of people whom we would like to align with. So just making a shift on the document that all of you have, and we could send you more copies of it if you are interested. The suggestion is that the future of science, technology, and innovation may not be just traditional knowledge, which we celebrate often and we even mention in our science policy document, or also just speak of the visible and popular successes of the Moon Mission or the Chandrayaan or the Nano or the Infosys campus in Mysore. Uh, but this document essentially speaks about you know, elements and the picture speaks about different kinds of understandings of science and technology. What's happening in the Chengala Chula slum in Trivandrum, which was designed by Laurie Baker using sustainability as an important principle, but giving people there a dignity of life, or the issue of the system of rice intensification, and farmers actually accepting this in, in large numbers, but getting about 40, 50 scientists of this huge scientific establishment to actually work on this is the great challenge. Rainwater harvesting is a huge phenomenon, and of course, also a new system that's come out of the rural automatic teller machine, which has been linked up with the NREGA to try and provide uh, access for women laborers. What is interesting is the social process that actually led to this kind of design by this company called the Vortex Engineering. And I'll not get into this in any detail now. But what are the social processes that lead to these innovations? Would centers of innovation that the NIC speak of, will it be enough or do we also have to look at some of these social processes? So some of the paradoxes of the Indian SNT establishment, I'll skip this. Basically, we have in some sense a certain amount of self-reliance in food, but there's no Swaraj for the farmer who is committing suicide. We are able to export Green Revolution to Africa, or we seek to export it, but we are not bothered about what's happening inside with our ecological stress for in farming and so on. We are not willing to sufficiently acknowledge the North within the South. The fact that climate change is about equity issues and these climate warriors who have actually been responsible for our low per capita consumption and emissions, they have a knowledge system which needs recognition and support. How can India's decade of innovation account for this India's diversity and plurality of knowledge? A simple equation which we all face is the celebrated billionaire or multimillionaire who believes who's in the Forbes list with his 27 or 28 story building and the fact that we have the Dongria cones who are displaced by mining projects in, in remote Orissa, it's because of this combination that the rich need these kinds of poor to keep our 1.1 tons per capita going. And it's that what, that's what we use with regard to our international negotiations. So it's a small but powerful needs, rich need the powerless in some way to keep at their own kind of level if we are to continue in this mode. What about the science and technology innovation for these climate warriors? who have actually brought this 1.1 ton per capita. How do we account for this phenomenon of rich lands and poor people? The last science policy document talks about, uh, in 2003, that the society has to catch up with science. Indian citizens are lacking in scientific temper, and the message of science has to reach every citizen. And we also have more recent discussions, represented possibly by this down-to-earth article, there by Sunita Narayan speaking of scientists missing in action. Uh, where civil society and cit citizens seem to have little say in science policy. The role of science in Indian democracy is being revisited with a new intensity that's happening in many parts of India. The only problem is that the key players, Indian scientists, are often missing in action. The planning process seems to involve too far too few citizens, and we did an analysis of the 11th plan to do so. Hopefully the 12th plan will be better. And the public distress on science, which was much more a phenomenon four or five years back in, in the European Union, which led to the kinds of reports that I mentioned earlier, is now actually increasing substantially in, uh, in India as well. So the question we asked ourselves in some sense is, can we look at Indian traditions of society actually speaking back to science, to use Michael Gibbons uh, you know, terms? So we said we need to look at relook at expertise 
And if we really have to relook at expertise, we have to be open to critiques of science. If society is going to be more and more vulnerable if it does not recognize the plurality of knowledge, and there have been experiments on science and technology from civil society for policy, which we probably need to take into account. We use Gandhi as an inspiration, and we had a discussion in 2009 where a group of us took Hind Swaraj seriously and said, can we look at this as a document for the future? Can we actually base this as a way to rethink Indian science and technology? And then we revised this document over a period of time and then came out with a document which, again, even this document is not a final document. We think it's an offering for us to think, revise, and co-create newer versions of it. This document is not anti-science, but is not shy of being critical of science. Uh, there was a presentation in Hyderabad, and some of you were part of this presentation, and we received inputs, and we also had a pilot project which we had uh, released. The version 2 got released in May, and the printing just got over a few days back. There are the possibilities of other versions and forms too. Very simply put, the, these are the chapters. The first chapter is a lot about how do we look at expertise? Can we look at expertise somewhat differently? Can actually we not just speak of a social contract of science? Can we move to a trusteeship of science? Uh, can we have a new role for science in this? What's the link between science, nonviolence, and knowledge democracy? What kinds of, what are the contribution of social institutions to science in India? How do we take forward this agenda of sustainability, plurality, and justice? What's the role of ethics and technoscience? And probably much more needs to be written in this chapter on ethics and technoscience. And in some sense, we've said, if it is an energy, can we talk about energy swaraj and uh, energy service, et cetera, in a different way? And finally, we suggest that we need several democratic experiments that we need to learn from. And I'll mention a few with some insights from the Kisan Swaraj Yatra that was conducted by very many people, and also a societal dialogue on uh, nanotechnology that happened in the Netherlands. So justice, plurality, and sustainability being the key ideas that we want. Well, we speak of justice, we speak of cognitive justice. In plurality, we recognize that there are multiple knowledge systems. There are different kinds of experts. And how do we actually tap the capacity of the marginalized to contribute? Can we create new commons to make this happen? Uh, on sustainability, can we actually move one step further and contribute to, to a theory of nonviolence? In many of these, we've suggested that civil society in India, which is strong, does have a role to play in this science swaraj. We had five pilots, and I won't go into details of it. One was on medical ethics, which is looking at the issues of technoscience of a case of unindicated hysterectomies happening just about 100 kilometers away from Andhra Pradesh in rural Andhra Pradesh, where women were being, because of the availability of a particular system, with absolutely no regulations, women were being forced into taking on a, a hysterectomy, which had long-term deleterious consequences for them. They were laborers and who couldn't perform many of their tasks a bit later. A, a doctor couple who felt strongly about it and had this idea of technological responsibility who took it further. We also had a case study which was looking at the three disasters in Gujarat, Kosi, and Tamil Nadu. And if 22% of carbon emissions are coming from the construction industry, the period during a disaster reconstruction, actually all this gets very ac acute and strengthened. The guidelines, if they don't promote plurality, we're actually contributing a lot to climate change, not to mention in unhabitable households for many of the people who are coming out. And this was a comparison of the three disasters. The democratizing water sector was trying to explore the plus and minus of civil society involvement. In which places does it work, and that it probably doesn't quite work, uh, and so on. And the two other case studies, all of this came as a pilot handbook on science and technology, which is there on the net, and that's the URL. There were two other case studies which also led to some consultative workshops. One was on the non-pesticidal management movement on ecological farming, and another was on the democratization of climate change debates. The interesting thing about the consultative workshops, and I'm just mentioning two of them, is the fact that there was an international side to it in climate change, but there was also, India is known for its climate change contribution internationally, but when tribal communities, minority groups were asking about what does it mean to us, there didn't seem to be enough people explaining this to them. We had. Professor Srinivasan from I, in the Indian Institute of Science actually had quite, he was surprised to find that the possibility of this engagement, the nature of questions that were asked, and hopefully these questions will actually translate into research programs later. 
the question in, uh, in, on the ecological farming was the fact that despite the fact that this has been upscaled in a huge extent in the government of Andhra Pradesh, why is it that the Department of Agriculture does not take it as regular mainstream practice? The case study had some positives. When we bring science and society together, the National Institution of Nutrition and Life HRG, the civil society group, working together, they were able to put some pressure on the government of Andhra Pradesh, and the government of Andhra Pradesh came out with a circular to try and make a change. Over a period of time, things do change, but it takes a lot of time. The government of Andhra Pradesh has also implemented non-pesticidal management in this Karif season. The lessons is that we need a certain kind of ex engaged expertise. How and why these pilots have shown us that non-experts should be consulted on choices of priority, policy, and ethics. And in this civil society, organizations have an important role to play. Socialization of science needs newer institutions and capacities. And this knowledge dialogue that occurs, as we showed in those areas, uh, very few spaces exist to enable these kinds of knowledge dialogue between science and society. And these have extremely good beneficial effects. Workshops and consultation platforms are required for inclusive innovation. Can we actually see science policy as articulating Swaraj? Can we look beyond issues of access of science and technology and spending on science and technology? How do we move from 0.8% of the R&D spending to 1% of R&D spending to look at other issues relating to articulating Swaraj and the need for scientists of all kind to have a certain amount of technological responsibility? The manifesto is being taken forward, and I'll not go into it. Some interesting <coughs> insights from people in the field saying it has helped us in taking on a, a, a document with the FAO. Uh, and I'd like to end with this, that societal dialogues are needed for inclusive innovation. We can learn from other experiences. There was an extremely interesting experiment on a societal dialogue on nanotechnology, and the pictures that you're able to see here from the nanopodium.nl website shows that citizens are seriously engaging in discussions on something as, in some sense, technically complex as nanotechnology. Pankaj could probably speak much more on, on, on all of this. But we would like to suggest that let us not make alternatives a footnote or an afterthought of a document. Can we actually move this center stage? Thank you. The manifesto is an open source document, and we invite you to try and contribute, criticize, and create your own versions of it. Thank you very much.